Good morning, Cross Point. Welcome to church. We're going to do things a little bit differently this morning, a little bit simpler, um, which is kind of nice. So if you want to sit or stand or take whatever posture of worship um, you'd like to, we'll dive right in. Arise, my soul. That's good. Is that not why we're here this morning? All of this for God's glory. Right, church? Ah, see, you're hot. You're warmed up this morning. I love it. That's good. Good morning. My name is Scott. I hope that this morning you're blessed just by the simplicity and the intimacy of the worship this morning. And I just want to encourage you as they continue to do songs later, uh, just take the posture that fits for you. And just in the in the simplicity of worship this morning, just may it just be you and Jesus. Don't worry about the person on either side of you. Just you and Jesus this morning. Is that okay? 
All right. So a few announcements for you this morning. If you're new here this morning, we are so glad you're here. First time visitors, you can fill out our Connect card. It's going to be on the screen. Uh, and uh, you can meet myself, Stephen, Pastor John, anybody in the lobby. Say hello. Let us know how you found out about Crosspoint. And there is a gift for you. There's a local service opportunity for you, Crosspoint, and uh, I encourage you to be a part of this. There's uh, two volunteers needed for this coming Friday, July 28th, to serve at the Frederick and Community Kitchens from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, if you're available, you can register with a link on the screen uh, or chat with Stephen after today's service. There's all kinds of things you can talk to Stephen about today. Uh, participations, I will say, participants, you have to be at least 14 years old to take part in that ministry opportunity. And again, I want to encourage you, Crosspoint, if that's something that you'd love to be a part of, don't hesitate, don't think, just do. Uh, baptisms and barbecue. Oh, that was so bad. I, I don't know if maybe you didn't hear me say baptisms there. All right, so maybe we're not as warmed up as I thought we were. Baptisms and barbecue would happen on July 30th. Uh, of course, it, I don't know about you, but it's my favorite Sunday of the year where we, after church, we walk down the hill to the Nashwack. <laughs> so, <laughs> first thing I thought of when I heard him say that was that insurance selling duck. <laughs> Aflac. Anyway, we're going to go to the Nashwalk River after church. It's my favorite Sunday of the year. If you want to be baptized, if you're here and you've taken a step and you've, you've given your life to Jesus and you've not been baptized, I want to encourage you. This is an announcement for you, and we encourage you to take that next step. Talk to your pastors and say, yeah, you know what? I'm thinking about this baptism thing. We'd love to have you involved in that. There's a link on the screen. And let one of the staff members know, hey, I want to be baptized because we want to celebrate you and your, this next step of faith in your journey. All are invited to attend this, of course. It is awesome. And then afterwards, we're going to celebrate by eating food, having a church-wide barbecue. Just show up. Just be there. It's going to be great. Uh, Saturday, August 12th, Aqua Ball. This is fun. Did this last year, was a part of it. There's probably a video footage out there somewhere in the archives of Crosspoint or Pastor Nikki's Facebook page of me doing a belly flop into home pool. It happened. It was painful. Anyway, corporate kids and Crosspoint kids are combining forces and, and to bring families together in an epic battle of aqua ball. It's soccer baseball with your baselines being slip and slides and your bases being pools. It is incredible. It is fun. It hurts. Uh, they're going to be gathered at the Marysville Heritage Center, 11 McGloin Street, just again, just down the hill here, uh, and you can show up for that August 12th, 2023, from 1 p.m. until 3, and going to team up and square off for some fun ways to beat the heat, make great connections, and engage in some competitive fun, though I will say it might not be quite as competitive this year because Pierre no longer lives in this area. Uh, between Pierre and and uh, Brad uh, and Tafera, it got a little intense last year, but it, it was a great time and everybody had a blast doing it. Uh, you can register yourself and your family using the link on the screen as well for that. Do not miss it. It is going to be a good time if you have CK, CP kids in your family. One more real quick one, a personal one for me, of course, Joy 96.5. We have a concert happening this Thursday at Journey Church Fredericton. His name is Jordan St. Cyr. He's a Juno Award winner. He is a Canadian, uh, and he is just plain awesome. He played in the Grand Ole Opry last year, so he's no slouch. It's going to be an amazing concert. You can find tickets for that. This is our last Sunday before we uh, go to this concert, before this concert happens. So you can find tickets for that at joyfm.ca, uh, 30 pre-sale, 35 at the door. I would absolutely love, personal, personal request here, I would love to see a pile of my Crosspoint family rocking out at this concert and just, uh, you know, showing Jordan St. Cyr how much you appreciate his ministry and, uh, you know, there's more concerts to come, but we need to be a part of this one. So again, joyfm.ca, this Thursday at Journey Church, Fredericton, uh, Jordan St. Cyr. I would love for you guys to be a part of it. This is my official managerial invitation. There you go. See you on Thursday. You guys can stand, sit, whatever you want to do. We're going to continue in worship this morning. Secret 
my best ideas are yours. So what am I but what you make of me? So help me, God, with all my weakness for all.
lead us in a focused time of prayer today. We, uh, we lost one of our friends yesterday, longtime member of this church, uh, supporter of mine, Bud Pond passed away just yesterday morning. And so we have heavy hearts today, but we know what Jesus says is that blessed are those of you who mourn for you will be comforted. And we also know that tension that he shares in Luke's gospel of how Blessed are you who weep now, because in due time you will laugh. But there's a tension between celebrating and, and mourning, and we don't want to jump past one important part of that. And so I would love for you to join in praying for the family, the extended friends. There's quite a long legacy. I remember first getting to know Bud when I was an intern here in 2008, and he was a custodian at the time. And I remember when I became youth pastor, not that youth would ever become... Uh, wild or anything like that, but maybe one time when there was a hole in the wall and I came in the next morning and said to Bud, yeah, that's my responsibility. And I just remember the grace that he extended to me and uh, even in our phone calls and, and prayers and, and much support, not always understanding everything that us young whippersnappers do, but, uh, but supporting um, just what God is doing in this church and uh, I would have loved for him to see these new steps because it wasn't that too long ago that there used to be steps down to Marshall Street and he would have been cleaning the snow off those. And, um, and so we can have heavy hearts, but we can also celebrate the faith and, and what he's left in such a prayer warrior, especially in these last few years uh, when the church needed it a lot. So 
would you pray now? We, we know he's in very good hands, but for those of us that feel the gap right now, could we be praying that God would continue to bless those who mourn? Father, thank you so much for, for Bud, for our friend Charles Pond, who would have been a member here for over 70 years. And we thank you for his life and legacy. And, and we're sad to see him go, but we're so grateful for your mercy. And we know his faith and his confidence in you. And just this Easter, how he was celebrating that hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. And that's the hope and the faith that he's had. And so we're confident that he's in in your hands now. And so we want to take a moment to, to pray for those who are grieving this week. And as we come to support even on, on Friday and visitation and, and Saturday for the funeral, we, we will mourn, but we will also celebrate the home going, coming. And in these times where there's that tension between weep, weeping and, and, and laughter, um, we do pray for comfort. We thank you for that, that blessing. We pray that you would encourage the family in this time, that they would have many fond memories and reflect. And so uh, for this church um, that he served and prayed for for so many years, we, we thank you for the legacy he leaves. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for something completely different. Imagine following that up with a sermon. We'll try. Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right, it starts now. Just a little icebreaker. Maybe you'll see where I'm going with this, but we'll create some friendly division in the room for just a moment, just for some tension, for some laughter. On the topic of text messages, how many of you are a blue bubble, and how many of you are a green bubble? Show of hands, blue bubble. If you don't know what that is, then that's another discussion altogether. <laughs> all right, all right. If you're a blue bubble and you get a green bubble, you're like, what is this? Who is this? Doesn't matter if it's your mother, you're like, I'm not texting them back. They need a blue bubble. But on the other hand, if they're a green bubble, anyone? No, is it just me? You, are you a green bubble? You're a blue bubble? Which one? Green, blue? Okay. So how many are blue? Okay, okay. How many are green? How many don't know? <laughs> Just <laughs> You're better off. All right. In the topic of pets, this isn't a trick question. Dogs or cats? Exactly. Now, this might be fitting, and you can think about after lunch, maybe, but I mean, sometimes you do it before lunch. I, you're adults, you can do what you want. Ice cream, chocolate or vanilla? I was not expecting such a toss-up. That sounded like it should have been much more simplistic. Um, this one can be tough. This, I don't know, Coke or Pepsi? Now, how many of you, when you go to the restaurant, uh, I know someone who does this, they'll ask for, say, a Diet Coke, and they're like, is Diet Pepsi okay? And it's like, is Monopoly money okay? I don't know, like, you tell me. <laughs> like, when you want a Diet Coke with a lime, you're not gonna go for Pepsi. Now, I know that, that this, this is creating some division. Final, final one, and we're, just, we're friends here, right? We're friends here, right? Right? <laughs> Mac and cheese. Fork or spoon? <laughs> Did someone say spork? Because that's a, I think that was the chunky soup kind of, uh, that, that was clever. But yeah, in the midst of all that, even if you are a green bubble and you should be a blue, I mean, you should be a blue, you know, uh, even if you like cats, that's, that's one, I mean, they're made for murder, but dogs are, are at least friendly and... <laughs> And whether you like chocolate or vanilla, I swirl them together. Who, what do I care? Coke or Pepsi is just, I mean, how about a bubbly instead? Um, 
fork or spoon, as, as long as I can shovel it in. We used to race. We used to make our own craft dinner and then go play ball hockey. Bad mistake. But I just, I just think, like, as long as you do it right, you know, it, it's, it's all good. But, but today, surprisingly, if it, if it doesn't make sense yet, it, it will in a moment. But um, our subject today is loving others and having compassion and mercy. And it is hard. When, I'm, when I see, the, like, there's a whole uh, group text it, I think in our family bubble, it's all blue, and so that, that's good, and so you can see the dot, 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 and it, everything works, but when there's a green and it gets all messed up, I just don't think we're ready to, to mix technologies like that. I just don't, that's fine if you think the green ones are better, they, maybe it is, but if, if you're all blue and then there's this one green one, it's like, what are you even doing? What are you doing? But we can love each other, right? We can, we can be friendly. We can have compassion and mercy. This week, as I was getting ready for our main text, this verse came up. It kind of in my mind from Micah 6, 8, maybe some of you even have it memorized. The Lord has told you what is good and what he requires of you to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so just for a preview of what we're going to look at today, we're actually going to look at the story about actually the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I don't know if you heard this, I, I had a friend that got to go to, to Princeton, and I had a, a professor that went there as well, and apparently they had this kind of test, um, kind of a, a test among some of their students uh, at Princeton in the theological department one time. They were supposed to give a lecture on the Good Samaritan, and most people are at least familiar. You've at least watched Seinfeld before, and so you, you, know, you know about the Good Samaritan or, or, the, or the law that was created about that. But what happened is they asked these students to give a lecture on the Good Samaritan. They'd have to read it and give a talk. Not a sermon per se, but just teach people on it. But the trick was, and they set this up, and it's, it's almost evil what they did to them. What they did is they sent them to one building and then said, oh, actually, you have to give the talk in this other building over here. And there's this path in between the two buildings. Well, didn't someone look like they were having a heart attack and they were going to be late for giving their lecture and, you know, their grade depended on it. And so the trick was to find out how many of these students would actually stop and assist the person who was in need or how many would be like, actually, like, I, I'm already running late. Like, I need to get going. And so can you imagine you're, you're on the way to give this talk. You're prepared. You've read the thing. You understand it. You're like, oh, I'm at least going to get like a B plus, if not an A minus. Maybe I'll even get an A if, if I'm feeling really good. And then there's someone in need on the way, and you're like, what an inconvenience. Like, I, I can't be late for this. My grade depends on I'm prepared. Like, so sorry. Someone else is going to help you. I got to go over here. And so the, the trick was finding out how many people who were running late actually skip by, and I guess about 10% of the people who were running extremely late would actually stop. Now, if someone was just like, you know, you have about 10 minutes to get over there, they might have stopped and, and tried to make a phone call or, or look to see, is there, is there anyone nearby that I can call? And then for the people that, you know, you had all the time in the world, most of them would stop and help this person. But the ones that are running late, and ha is anyone in here ever running late? I know most of you are always on time, you're early, uh, but, uh, but for those of us that feel like, well, I already have something else to do and something else to do right after that, it's hard to stop for the needs as great as they might be. And so that seems like, like such, a, such a trick, but this is the context for us today. And what you need to know is that neighbor, it isn't a noun in this context, it's actually a verb. And so with that, we're going to start in Luke's gospel in chapter 10, verse 25, and it starts, there's kind of a different subsection here, but it's really all one story. It starts this way. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus, asking him this question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. 
The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and left him half dead beside the road. And by chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Father, we thank you for this story and all the questions in here. And we just think of this image and how it sounds so easy and yet it's incredibly difficult. And so uh, would you give us grace even in this moment, and would you help us to understand what it is you have for us and give us what we need to actually do this, go and do this like you say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it all started out with a, a question, and the way that Luke lets us know, this isn't the first time something like this has happened, is that someone, you know, in this case an expert of religious law, they stood up to test Jesus. Now, maybe he knew or, or whoever was firsthand here giving him uh, this information could tell by the way he was posturing himself. You know, sometimes you can tell, is this a question or a statement? Or is this a trap? Like, are you, are you trying, to, trying to get something out of me here? It, it's not meant to be a trick question all the time. But in this case, it sounds like it was a test to see what Jesus is going to say. And I love the counter question. A lot of people hone in on, notice what Jesus does. He asks two questions back. What does the law of Moses say? Because this expert knows exactly what the law says, all of it. But the, the next kind of section you might miss, how do you read it? Which gets down to applying it. And the man actually has this beautiful answer. There's other places in the Gospels where it's Jesus saying, after they say, what's the most important commandment? And he says, well, to love God with your whole self and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that sums it all up. Yeah, it, it really does. It sums up even the, the two tablets, the Ten Commandments. Loving God with your whole heart. Yes, it's all ten, but especially the first four. And then six through ten, or sorry, the rest of them, the, the other six would be about loving your neighbor. And so often it was Jesus that said this. And perhaps both happened, and this man was actually quoting Scripture in the way that Jesus would. And so, of course, Jesus says, right, do this and you will live. So he, he's actually pleased with the answer, and that would have been a fine finish to the story. But there's another question. The man wanted to justify his actions. So first, he wanted to test Jesus to see if that might stump him. And now it's to justify his own actions. He answered appropriately, but, you know, knowing the answer and actually doing the answer is completely different. And he says, and who is my neighbor? Because if there's any loophole, he could get out of it. Lawyers are good at that. That's, that's their job. But in this case, of course, it's different than maybe our modern day lawyer, but they would understand God's law. They would understand the law of Moses inside and out, and they would be consulted often. And so Jesus responds with this story that seems to transcend Christianity and has, has got into uh, common laws and, and, and different things uh, worldwide. It's in pop culture. A lot of people use it and maybe misuse it to an extent, but they get the underlying point to be this good Samaritan. Well, in the actual ver version that we're reading here, 
uh, the word good Samaritan isn't in there, but despised Samaritan is. Uh, may, maybe some people are the blue bubbles, and, and actually this is someone with a green bubble, and they're like, I can't believe this person. Or, or, or maybe they happen to like cats, like what the heck, right? Or, or, or perhaps whatever your preference on soda is, it's the opposite. Like it, it doesn't have to always be that strict, uh, but it could be funny. Maybe, maybe they use a spoon instead of a fork. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, but we use that term good Samaritan because that's the interpretation that's given. But really, the positive thing that this man replies with isn't with his name or title or anything like that. It's the one who showed him mercy. And so go and do likewise. So there's questions and counter questions. And really, this question about a law led to a better understanding of the gospel. Did you notice that? It gave this great opportunity for Jesus to leverage what's already in the Old Testament and reveal something that now is in what we consider the New Testament. And this is what I mean by this. Well, Uh, Augustine said that the gospel is concealed in the Old Testament, but it's revealed in the New Testament. Did you notice that? Everything's pointing to Jesus, and there's actually some really good stuff that's helping us to kind of see why we need Jesus and and this good news. But what we want to move from is from being informed to transformed. This man was extremely informed on the law, and he actually answered appropriately but Jesus doesn't want him to just be informed with, yeah, that's, that's it. Don't just know it, do it. And that's our tension today. Uh, many notice that there's actually different philosophies recorded in this story, this parable, if you will, that Jesus gives. The first one is the robbers. The robbers, if you were to quote what they're thinking, is that what's yours is ours and we'll take it. That's what led to this man being attacked by the bandits is what's yours is actually ours. We're going to take that from you. But then from the priest and the Levite, maybe their philosophy was what's ours is ours. and We're going to keep it. And so there's like a separation there. But fascinating is that the Samaritan, the philosophy that it seems like he lives by is what's mine is yours and I'm going to share it. And that's what Jesus is trying to point out here. What's mine is yours and I'm going to share it. I don't know if you noticed all that happens here. The others, it it just mentions that they see the man lying there. It's probably pretty awkward. He's he's naked. He's he's beat up. Obviously needs some help. Does he look dead? Not sure. Either one of them should have and and, and could have uh, probably helped him. But for different reasons, we don't know everything they're thinking. But they don't. But this man, when he came along, just like the other two, he saw him just like them, yet it says he felt compassion on him, and that's not the end. Going over to him, it gets closer, he gets closer to the mess and the awkwardness. He actually gets down to his level, soothes his wounds, and Luke, we believe, is a physician, so maybe maybe he actually included some of this extra information because it might not sound like much to us today, but by saying that he sued his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them, it's, it's like a medicinal compress that he would have put on this man. And so Luke might have been really intrigued and known like, yeah, like he's actually, he's going above and beyond here with what he has to offer. He got the first aid kit off the donkey. You know how, you know where you prepare that you like kind of keep it ready at the, you know, the back end, but like not the actual back end, but you know, you kind of have it ready in your car or wherever, your donkey, whatever. And, and I love this. He put the man on his own donkey, assuming that he only had one when he was walking. We don't know otherwise. It meant that he walked the rest of the way. We notice this as well in verse 35. It says, the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins. So he didn't just go over to the guy. And he didn't just bandage him. He actually did some difficult work to get this guy some help, continue to care for him. And he's into the second day. He was probably busy. We don't know for sure. But he was definitely going to do something. And it's the next day that he's actually paying roughly two days wages, telling the innkeeper, take care of this man. As in, like, I've been taking care of him. I need to go do something, but I'm good for this. If it costs more, 
I'm going to give you more when I come back the next time. And so I'm willing to go even beyond that. And we don't know the rest of that part of the story. We just know that the first two could have and should have probably got into the messiness. They didn't. But this man who's considered despised, he had compassion. He showed mercy. And the man's response to Jesus' question at the end is, yeah, he, he showed him mercy. And so Jesus says, yes, now go and do the same. Don't just go around saying, what a great story. I'm going to add this to my vocabulary of all the laws. And Jesus said this, so let's add that. Yeah, you should do that. Ooh, just by saying do that, it implies that you can't just talk about it and say, yeah, that's what you should do is the word that Jesus is trying to get at here. And this is the tension for the first two, is that it's messy. What Ken here says is that maintaining ceremonially cleanliness was more important than doing the messy work of responding to human need. If you've ever responded to human need from a baby all the way up, there's one thing that we can agree on. It's messy. But for these two who knew better, being clean, wiping their hands clean of this, was more important than doing the messy work of responding to human needs. So that's the tension that we're dealing with here. I mentioned at the beginning that this, this man, he's, he's asking now, I need to justify, justify myself right here by saying, who is my neighbor? Neighbor being a noun, but Jesus is trying to imply, no, it's about being a neighbor, and there's this kind of flip-flop who is the neighbor here? Well, it's actually the one doing the thing. And so in this context, what if it's a verb? And if we agree that it's a verb, then maybe a better question would be to who is my neighbor is how do I neighbor? That's a different way of saying it. Another way would be to say, how do I become a good neighbor? Many in the commentaries would say that it's almost like Jesus is trying to change that noun neighbor to neighborliness. You know, and, and not necessarily Mr. Rogers, but like, won't you be my neighbor? Well, no, won't you be a neighbor is, is kind of the context here. And so maybe that question is, how do I become a good neighbor? And so the rest of what we're going to talk about is really the application. And so if you think about it, it starts with a question, leads to some counter questions, more questions to dive deeper, and it ends with a question. And so the point that Jesus is trying to leverage here is that questions must lead to action. And so that's the application for today that we're going to see. Everything that we look at will be questions that can help us to know not just what should we know, how can we be informed. You're informed, how can you be transformed? And so let's look at that. So the, the answer when you get to the bottom line, the end of this passage is, it's all about the one who showed mercy. It's not just to feel compassion alone. Compassion's important, sure. But feeling compassion, as we've noticed, that Jesus, rarely would he just sit back and like, oh, I feel for them, and then move on. No, he would actually move forward towards people, even messy people, and actually show compassion. Not just feel compassion, but show it through mercy. And so I have this question. If, if Jesus is saying, now go and do the same, well, maybe how we could think of it in this context, no, it's not always going to be someone that is on the other end of a bandit attack. No, not, not all the time. That sounds like the Wild West to us, maybe. But maybe you could ask these questions. How would you feel if you were that person in need? Start there. How would you feel if you were on the other end of it? And what would they do, as in what would a good neighbor do to help you? So if you flip it just for a moment, just to, just to feel that tension of you're the one who just lost your wallet and your keys, your car's gone, uh, your donkey's nowhere to be seen, how would you feel in that circumstance? What would you want a good neighbor to come and do? So then if you flip it, you already start to have the answer of how to apply what Jesus is teaching here. But here's the other tension, is that perhaps for the first two, it wasn't just clean and messy. It, it wasn't just that, but perhaps it was fear overpowering compassion. We don't know based on the way Jesus taught, but a normal person would probably at least feel some pity. 
right? That's probably all our head shaking. But have you ever been here? Have you ever felt the nudge to do something, but then fear won? Just me? I don't know. There's some times where it's like, it's so clear that I have to go do this, but it's like, do, 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 do. must back away, must get over here, must go to the other side of the road. Maybe, maybe it's just the pastor, but I think that sometimes we feel the nudge to do the thing, but fear wins. Have you ever been there? If you have, then maybe you could ask this question, what would a good neighbor do? Not how would they feel. It's not just feeling pity because perhaps a good neighbor would feel the fear, but act anyway. What would a good neighbor do? If, if I was the one in need, I would hope someone would eventually stop. Maybe several cars would go by. I've been on the side of the road before with an old Volvo that had no business being on I-95 outside of Boston. But when the steam was coming out of it, someone stopped. And actually, the guy was pretty excited to stop because he's like, I just bought this thing. Uh, I'm going to boost. I'm going to try it for the very first time. And it's like, you don't always want someone to try something for the first time on you. Like, if you're going in for surgery, hey, this is my first heart surgery. Can I have someone else? Second opinion, at least. Uh, second surgeon, anyone? But I've been there, and all I wanted was for someone to stop. Actually, the funny part about that story is that the first person that stopped was like, hey, I know that like no one ever stops uh, when, when you're on the side of the road. I just wanted to say, I'm sorry. And then they left. I was like, <laughs> what good was that? <laughs> you don't even have jumper cables? Like, what, what are you doing, bud? Anyway, but the, that guy eventually stopped and helped me, and I did get home. Here I am. But <laughs> what would a good neighbor do? Would they, would they stop? You would hope that they would, but will you be the good neighbor if you're willing to ask that question? So I want to just think about that feeling. Just before we move on from that uncomfortable feeling, think of it this way. Let how someone in need feels drive what you can do to help. One more time, just back the tape up. Let how someone in need feels drive what you can do to help because you just felt what it was like to be in that situation even for a minute you had like yeah I can I get that so let that drive what you're going to do to help I think the trick is here especially for someone who's an expert in the religious law or for some of us we're an expert in in the scriptures we know it's easy to find out at least what Jesus said it's another thing to apply what he wants us to do with that so I think there's also this tension between being obligated and compelled. I don't like the word obligated. Do you have obligations? You don't want to do those things, right? But you're obligated to do them. But have you ever been compelled to do something? Like, I must do this. And it's a different attitude, isn't it? It's almost like I get to, yeah, I have to, but it's more that I get to. Have you, have you been there? When you're compelled to do something, it's coming from a different heart posture, I think. And so it's not, who am I obligated to love? Like, well, the law of Moses says this. Jesus told me I have to love everyone. I guess I have to. No, what if it's, who am I compelled by love to respond? Who am I compelled by love to respond? If you understand the love of Jesus and you've been touched by it yourself, wouldn't that then start to compel you, transform you from just informed to transform so that you can actually be compelled like, no, I want to be more like Jesus, who didn't just feel compassion at a distance, but move forward and let it lead to showing mercy, doing the hard work, the messy work of it. We've asked this question before, just last fall, as a staff, we were reading through one of Craig Rochelle's uh, books, and uh, he's the pastor of, of Life Church, and, and we're grateful for his team bringing us the, the Bible app, version. and, you know, there's been like, I guess a you know, a billion downloads probably now, and, and they've been 15 years strong, and uh, it's been super helpful. There was a book we were reading just last year, and we were thinking of it in the context of I Love My City. And he, his question is this, is there an unmet need in your community that your church might be uniquely able to meet? Absolutely there is, but what is it, right? So the question again is, is there an unmet need in your community that your church, as in the group of us, 
might be uniquely able to meet? I think that's a great question. I, I want to just apply it like a step or two back from that because that, that could be even big picture. But let me, let me just make it really specific and individual for you. But you, you're going to be the one to actually make it specific. Is there an unmet need in your, and I'm going to give a blank, and I'm going to give you some options here that you, as in singular person that I could meet eyeball to eyeball, is there an unmet need that you might be able to meet, and here's the blanks, and maybe there's more than this, in your home, messy, in your neighborhood, awkward, at your work, also potentially awkward, uh, in your church, that's this place. Yeah, there probably is. I could give you a few. In your city, beyond. Fill in the blank. Is there an unmet need in your, you fill in the blank, that you specifically could meet? You should probably do it. How would you feel if you were the one in need? Well, you'd be like, well, I just wish someone would help me with this need. Yeah. You have the opportunity. Will you let fear win? Will you walk to the other side of the road? So in closing, the, the team's going to come up and lead us in. If you haven't seen it this way before, here's maybe your first opportunity. Maybe some of you are, are ahead of me, and I love this, and I, I mention it often because I think it's a beautiful part of reading Scripture and hearing Scripture and, and talking about it in community is that when you read a passage that you know or you've read before or you hear it talked about before or preached on before, do you notice that sometimes the Holy Spirit like gives you a new vision for it or, or something pops out in a fresh way? It's like, I thought I've read this before, but I'm seeing it with new perspective. Yeah, that's probably the Holy Spirit giving you a specific word for that moment. That's encouraging. Make a note of that. Highlight. Do whatever you can. Share it with someone else. Can I share what I noticed this week? Jesus is our good Samaritan. Have you noticed that before? Maybe some of you have. Now, it's not explicit in this story. I don't think that's the primary thing that we're supposed to get here, but stay with me for just a moment. Jesus is our good Samaritan. We were half dead on the side of the road. And then God had compassion on us and showed us mercy. Can anyone testify to that? Jesus moved into our neighborhood. He took on flesh and blood, walked among us. He came down to our level. He didn't just have compassion and go to the other side of the road, no. He got up and did the messy work to bring us comfort and healing and bring rest and safety and also to pay our tab. I love in Romans 5, 6, it reads this way. Paul shares that when we were utterly helpless, you could picture that man who was attacked by those bandits, stripped of everything he had, laying there, wounded. If he was conscious, he'd be praying that someone, God, send someone. Let them throw a blanket over me. Or something. This is awkward. This stinks. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time. At just the right time, like Lionel Messi in his opening debut game for Inter Miami. Injury time, tie game, penalty kick, scores. That's why he's the highest paid athlete in the world. At just the right time, he scored that goal. No, for us, it's much better. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came into our neighborhood at just the right time and died for us sinners. So God's love toward us should inspire us our love towards others. So instead of being obligated to love, what if we were compelled? No, I was that man. I needed a good neighbor to come by. Well, Jesus did. Let that compel us. Rather than trying to justify our actions, well, but God, you know how busy I am. I'm on the way to this other thing. This other, someone else will stop. What would a good neighbor do? Uh, it's called This Is Our God, and it's going to be played the next few weeks as we, we introduce it. So this is the acoustic version. <laughs> uh, 
and we'll have uh, hopefully full band versions later. But uh, yeah, please um, take part in it with us and sing along once you catch on to it. it the chorus is pretty, pretty uh, catchy, I think so. Yeah, stand or sit, whatever you'd like. Uh, we'll start. that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that were stood in our way but he came and he died and he rose those giants are dead now this is our god this is who he is he loves us this is our god this is what he does he saves us he bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Oh, remember that fear that took our breath away faith so weak that we could barely pray but he heard every word every whisper now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness never once did he fail and he never this is our God. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. Nobody but Him. but Jesus nobody but Jesus nobody but Jesus nobody but him this is our God this is who he is he loves us this is our God this is what he does he saves us he bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let 
heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. For the cross beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. This is our God, King Jesus. Oh. Amen. Just in closing, uh, isn't that true? That was us. We needed him to do it. And only he could and would when we could be considered despised or when the world considered him despised. He did it anyway for us. He's our good Samaritan. Go and do likewise for other people is what Jesus is trying to get across. We're excited to celebrate next Sunday. I don't know if you knew there was a barbecue happening, but the reason for the barbecue is the baptisms in the river. Isn't that exciting? So we believe that when we go under the water, it's as though we're buried with Christ. But when we come up out of the water, we're raised to new life because we trust in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. That's our hope. And so we want to invite you to that. If you need to get baptized, there's already some people signed up. And so you can let us know this week. And we'll go down into the river. And uh, the river's high enough. We don't have to go out too far. We'll just make sure we don't get dragged all the way down to Picaroons. But we'll have a barbecue to celebrate afterward. And it'll be awesome. And so we want to remind you of just these few things. There's a visitation in the afternoon from 2 to 4 on Friday. And from 6 to 8 uh, for, for Charles Pond, for Bud, for our friend. And the funeral will be 2 p.m. Saturday. Uh, myself, John Simons, Dr. H.C. Wilson will will take good care of that service. And uh, and so we invite you to, to come and, and be praying for the family and, and for the extended friends and everyone that, that knows them uh, this week. And uh, thank you for, for giving, for continuing to, to worship in that way and give in that way. And so you can give anytime. Use e-transfer. Give at crosspointchurch.ca. Use the boxes at the back. Uh, there's envelopes in many of the seat backs if you want to use cash or check. Debit machine in the lobby, super easy way to do it. Thanks for doing that. Do you like the new steps? It's awesome. Yeah, it's good. To continue to do things like that and, and more, uh, especially the ministry, but, uh, but maintenance is, is part of it. And so we thank you for contributing in all those ways. God bless you as you go.